It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this hour, uh, Brother Bob Coles. Uh, is a minister for the Norwood Church of Christ here in Knoxville, Tennessee. He's local, and he's been local here for a long time. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look at the, the pictures that are back there on the wall, uh, you'll see that uh, he has served as an adjunct instructor for the Southeast Institute of Biblical Studies, and before that, the East Tennessee School of Preaching and Missions uh, since 1989. And it's amazing when you look at the pictures, there's, there's one face that seems to always be constant in those pictures, and it's Brother Cole's. Uh, he's, he's a fixture here uh, at the school. He and his wife have one son and two granddaughters. Uh, he holds a Master of Divinity from Harding School of Theology. Uh, Bob is a great student of the Word. Uh, he believes in, in studying. He believes in working hard. And you will, go, you will have to go a long way to find someone uh, who better depicts a Christian gentleman than Brother Bob Coles. I, I think if you were to look up Christian gentleman in the dictionary, his picture... Uh, would probably be there. And uh, so I won't take up any more of his time. He's going to speak to us this morning on the Holy Spirit and salvation. And so I encourage you to, to give him your attention. To you all, it's certainly good to be here and be a part of this uh, lectureship. I'm going to be speaking on the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians, and so I have a couple of passages of Scripture that you can see, and that's what I'll be uh, dealing with this morning. Uh, there are really two approaches I can take to this lesson. One approach is the approach that Elizabeth Taylor took with all of her husbands when she said, this won't last very long. Well, the approach for me is, in conviction and conversion, the Holy Spirit works only through the Word. That is the bottom line. But I'd like to deal with a little bit more as I go through the lecture this morning. As I present this lecture, it is not going to be dealing with the work of the Holy Spirit in the Christian, but it is going to be dealing with the work of the Holy Spirit in the alien center. And so that is our subject. So the question is, how does the Holy Spirit work upon the heart of an individual? How is it that God is going to communicate to those that are sinful in this world? And so it's by the means of the Word of God that we're going to look at this morning as I go through and begin trying to understand these points. Now, the function of understanding the Godhead for many Christians, uh, as we look at one thought from Gordon Fee, he would say something like this, I believe in God the Father, I believe in God the Son, the Messiah, I wonder about the Holy Ghost. The idea is... What is the function of the Holy Spirit in our lives? When I was preaching at a congregation in West Tennessee, dire congregation, there was a TV program that came on early in the morning, right before service time, and so I would watch, watch it sometimes, and it would be like this, uh, what is your faith? That is the name of the, the program out of Memphis. There would be questions that would be sent in, and so there would be all these preachers that would be responding to it based on their faith. And so we had this being moderated by a Methodist preacher. Uh, there were many different denominations represented. There was a, a Greek Orthodox priest. There was a rabbi. And then there was a brother from the church, John Simpson, who was a graduate of Harding Graduate School as well as a preacher in the Memphis area. And so the question was posed to the Jewish rabbi, and it went like this, Rabbi, what is your view of the Holy Spirit? in the Old Testament, to which the rabbi said, I don't even know anything about a Holy Spirit. And then all of a sudden, John Simpson began to get into the mix with all of this, and he began to go through and look at some passages in the Old Testament where there is the reference to the Holy Spirit. He talked about the Spirit was given to Moses, and it was also given to the 70 elders. It was given to Joshua. It came upon Samson, and he killed a lion. We're going to see a number of judges that had received the Holy Spirit. We're going to also note that as we begin looking at, you're going to have to advance that for me. It's not, this is not working. Thank you. Uh, and so he began to go through and look at a number of passages where you would find the Holy Spirit. And as we look at this, notice in uh, Isaiah, we have a reference that there were those that had rebelled and grieve the Holy Spirit. 
There are those that uh, put the Holy Spirit in the midst of them who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses. The next slide, please. And then we note that there was this text from Joel that we'll see that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And again, I will pour out my spirit in those days, which is certainly cited by Peter on the day of Pentecost. And he would talk about this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And so we see a fulfillment in that respect. So to become a citizen of the kingdom of God, to be a member of the spiritual body, there has to be this regeneration. We're going to note that there are those that are born of water and the spirit. If you'll advance the next slide, please. We're going to see that we have in John's gospel, chapter 3 and verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless you be born again, born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Again, we go through and begin looking at what Paul says in first, uh, Romans chapter 6, dealing with the issue of baptism, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. We're going to see that our old self was crucified with him and that the body of sin might be destroyed. We are freed from sin. We we'll all admit that there is an influence of the Holy Spirit that is exerted in conversion. And the question is, how is the influence of the Spirit going to interact with the alien sinner? Is it going to be the situation where there's the direct operation of the Holy Spirit upon the heart of a sinner? Or is it that there is this preached word, this word that they have learned from Scripture that is going to make the difference? And I would like to, for us to go through and begin looking at some of these passages under consideration. Uh, if you'll look at the next, uh, there you go, thank you. And such as were some of you, but you were washed, you were ju sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. So let's begin looking at uh, what we have going on. We have three verbs that we want to look at this morning. First of all, we see the idea of washed, sanctified, and justified. If we take a look at the idea of being washed, we see the idea of being cleansed. We have been cleansed from our sins. If you go back and look at what is said... In verses 9 through 11, there's a catalog of sins that Paul is saying that don't do these things. And again, those that do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But there were those that decided to give that up. They repented of their sins and they became Christians. And so they had been washed. They had been cleansed. They had been sanctified. And they had been justified. And so as we begin to look at this, we see here is baptism that is signifying this cleansing element. They have been cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus. Then also the idea of sanctification is going to be where uh, they are separated from a life of sin in order to become a person of righteousness. That's what they've done. Thirdly, justified. They have been declared righteous in the sight of God. They now can approach God in salvation and worship and also be vindicated from their sins. Not only that, we're going to see that they are to live a life differently. They are to live a life that is going to be in harmony with the will of God. Now, as I go through, let's go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and so let's notice a little bit about the issue that we have going on with reference to the before and after. Before we see their life of sin, now we see that they had given up that lifestyle of sin. And so here are some things that we learn about how they did it. So we're going to look at the idea of washing for a moment. Notice this, that uh, we have Saul of Tarsus that is told to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins. We're going to see, Paul says in Ephesians 5, there is the cleansing by the washing of the water with the word. And then in Titus chapter 3, we're going to note that there is the washing of regeneration and then the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And then in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22, they had been made clean. And we're going to see by the washing of the water as we see this pure water in a consideration here. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, there's an interesting statement that came from Marshall Keeble. A man is not saved and then baptized. A woman doesn't wash clothes because they are already clean. She washes the clothes because they're dirty. And so man is baptized because he is dirty and needs to be clean. Uh, how simple can that be? The idea is making it very simple where people can understand. Be baptized and wash away your sins. So that's what they did 
as we begin looking at uh, this particular passage here. Next slide, please. Uh, let's look at a few thoughts here. Uh, I think people who have tried to understand sanctification would be able to understand it better if they took a look at this one passage that I have that Paul is going to explain it. Really, it is best explained by looking at what we have in 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 14. From the beginning, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. And he called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is the gospel that is the instrument of the Spirit whereby we're going to be saved. We're going to note that it is through the Word of God that the Spirit is going to perform His great work. So everything that we know about God, everything we know about Christ, everything we know about salvation, everything we know about hell and, and uh, heaven, and uh, everything we know about the church is going to be found through Scripture. Uh, let's go to the next verse. So let's take a look at this one. For in one spirit were we all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether bond or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. So as we go through and begin looking at this, we're going to see that we are brought into the body of Christ. And we're going to see that what we have here is not any kind of special baptism that is given to just a few. The baptism under consideration that we have that Paul is addressing here is going to be the baptism that is given to everyone. It's made available to every person. So we're going to note both Jew and Gentile, both bond and free, everyone is going to be able to receive the salvation that is under consideration. It is experienced by every believer. Now there's been much debate that has been made over all were given the one spirit to drink. Therefore, it seems that this is an additional metaphor that we have that talks about we have been inundated by the spirit, we have been baptized into Christ, and therefore we see within all of this the same field of image. And in one spirit, let's notice something about that for a moment. There are those that really take hermeneutical leaps uh, as we begin to look at the idea of baptism in the Holy Spirit. Hermeneutical. So therefore, we're going to note that uh, there is no connection with what we're talking about here and the idea of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I'd like to share a few thoughts with you regarding that. Uh, let's take a look at what John the Baptist is saying regarding Christ. He said Christ would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Jesus told his disciples to stay in Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. So they would be clothed with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. They were baptized in the Spirit. Only a few, that is, the apostles, they would receive this power, and it came upon them. And Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. This is the phenomenon that we have on the day of Pentecost. They're going to be speaking in languages that they've not studied. Seventeen languages are mentioned, and we see there for very clearly that that's one under consideration. As we look at the idea of all flesh or all peoples, we're going to see in Acts chapter 2, we're going to note that here are these Jews, these apostles. Uh, we'll get to Acts 10 in a moment, but we're going to note that there are these Gentiles that also receive this Spirit. And so it's another indication of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Only these two occasions do we find that. As we continue on, we're going to note that here is Cornelius that is being preached to by Peter and all of a sudden the Spirit comes upon them. And this is what Paul says. He says, if then God gave them the same gift as he gave to us when we believed, we're going to note that who was I that I could withstand God? Again, Paul is going to make reference to uh, this issue and his teaching and preaching. But again, Peter in the Jerusalem conference in Acts chapter 15 and verse 8 brings this up one more time. So there's nothing in the New Testament that is identified as baptism in the Spirit other than the two chapters that we have referred to, Acts 2, Acts 10. And then we're going to note that there is a baptism that was given to those in Ephesus. Paul would say that there is one baptism. That would be the baptism in water and not a baptism in the Holy Spirit. 
they would have been too late for this particular baptism, the baptism of the Spirit. So again, the Jews and the Gentiles receive the Spirit as we looked at Acts chapter 2 and verse 10. Now, the idea is that one should not expect to be receiving a baptism in the Holy Spirit today. What we do find is the baptism that is of the Great Commission. The laying on of the apostles' hands is also something that is important for us to look at. In Acts chapter 8, we have Philip going to Samaria, and he's preaching to those people. And there are those that repent and are baptized into Christ. He had sent for Peter and John to come from Jerusalem to come down and lay hands on these people. And so they do, and they began to speak in tongues. After that, we're going to note that here is Simon, what we call Simon the sorcery, sorcerer, that uh, wanted to have that gift. He really, I think, would want to bow the franchise so that he could impart this as well. So he was being rebuked by Peter. And then the next point that we want to look at is that we're going to see there's a chain of logic that we have to look at regarding this issue, and that is the imparting of the Holy Spirit through the laying on of the apostles' hands. Uh, the other account that we have is in Acts chapter 19, where we have Paul that is preaching to these 12 men at Ephesus. They had not even heard of the Holy Spirit. They had, had received John's baptism, and therefore he commanded them to be baptized. He lays hands on these individuals, and they speak in tongues. Well, as we begin looking at this, uh, we're going to note Philip was not able to impart that gift back in Acts chapter 8. Why would he have to send for John and Peter to come down and to impart that gift? And secondly, we're going to see that the gift of the Holy Spirit promised to every believer in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 uh, is going to be different from what we have Peter and John imparting with reference to this gift. So we have the gift of the Spirit that is imparted through the laying on of hands or the baptism of the Spirit. And then we have the gift of Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Thirdly, one notices that in the book of Acts, the laying on of the apostles' hands is not mentioned in every conversion. Only these two that we have, Acts 8 and Acts 19. The next point is, if this gift spoken of in Acts 8 came only through the laying on of the apostles' hands, so when the apostles died, this gift would have died as well. Those on whom the apostles had laid their hands that had received this miraculous gift would also have that gift dying when they died. The gift of the Holy Spirit, if we look at that in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, the gift of the Holy Spirit, what's under consideration? There is an argument in Greek that talks about the exegetical, exegetical genitive, and that is the thing that is in the genitive case is that which is received. A gift of $5 is $5. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 32, we're going to note that God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey Him. So as we look at the actions of the Holy Spirit, it's important for us to understand a few things regarding that, and that is that in the Christian life, when one receives the Holy Spirit, it is never described in terms of feelings. One has no biblical criteria for that. The idea is that we see that there are those that talk about their feelings at conversion. Well, we have to ask, well, is this feelings of the Holy Spirit or is this a feeling of a spirit of error? And uh, there are those that would like to say this, Lord, let us fill your Holy Spirit here today. But one never reads about this in the New Testament. Uh, as Brother Lewis, Jack Lewis once said, he said, this is the language of Ashdod and this is not this, the language of Christ. All right, the second point is we were all baptized. As mentioned earlier, we're going to see that the issue of baptism of the Holy Spirit is not under consideration here, but it is the idea that there are those that have been baptized into Christ. They had been washed. They have been sanctified. They have been justified. The administrator of the baptism of the Holy Spirit of Christ, the administrator of the baptism that we're looking at is done by man. So let's notice a couple things regarding the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is in reference to revelation. It's in reference to inspiration and confirmation. The baptism that we're looking at at this particular point is for the redemption of mankind, the washing away of sins. 
<clears throat> we're going to note that it also places one into the body of Christ. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was limited to just a few. But we're going to note the baptism of the Great Commission is that which is going to be given to all of mankind. It's immersion in water administered by man for the remission of sins. And it is going to add one to the body of Christ. Next, we'd like to look at this issue of the one body. We're going to note that there is this one body that they're going to be a part of. There's going to be this church that Jesus has established. And as we begin to look at this, we're going to note as we comply to the command of God to repent of our sins and be baptized to have our sins washed away, we are commanded to continue to follow the instruction of the Holy Spirit. And it is in this one body that we're going to function. The other issue is Jew, Gentile, bond or free. We're going to note the great unity that we have and that is salvation is available to all of mankind. Salvation is for all. The gospel is for all. Christ died for all of humanity. Then thirdly, fifthly rather, we were all made to drink of the one spirit. As we begin looking at this, the issue of baptism into the one body and drinking of the same spirit would be the results of the spirit's instruction in everything that we're talking about. One of the big issues we have to deal with in 1 Corinthians is the idea of unity, and there is a lot of division. And so here we're going to note, consider where you've been, consider the before, and consider the after, and consider how we ought to be living. Paul is encouraging unity to these Corinthians. He's saying, you are of one body. You have received the same instruction. You have received the same spirit and the same blessings. Next slide, please. So let's look at the idea of the work of the Spirit in conversion. Uh, we're going to note that God had the plan. Jesus Christ came and executed that plan. And after Jesus went to the cross, there was a comforter, the Holy Spirit, that would come after him. And it is this Spirit that made known the plan of God. We have this text from John chapter 14. When the Comforter, who is the Holy Spirit, comes, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance whatever I have said unto you. This is the plan that we have. And so the Spirit is going to inspire these apostles to present the message of truth to those that need to hear the gospel. So as we look at this, we're going to note this is the way the Holy Spirit is going to work in the conversion of an alien sinner. In John chapter 16... And as we look at uh, verses 7 through 14 that I'm looking at right now, the fourfold nature of the work of the Holy Spirit. First of all, to comfort. He will comfort you. Secondly, to reveal the truth. Thirdly, to glorify the Son. And then next, to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. That's what's going to happen. As we begin to look at the listeners, as we look at the day of Pentecost for a moment, we're going to see very clearly that they are converted through the preaching and the teaching that followed. And there are numerous examples that we have of that. Acts chapter 2. We're going to also see here is Philip going down to Samaria, preaching the gospel, and they are converted. We're going to note that uh, there's the preaching to Paul, Saul of Tarsus, or to Cornelius, or the Philippian jailer. So we have the book of Acts, a book of conversion. And all of these people are being convinced by the preaching and the teaching of the word of God. Jesus Christ said that the spirit would convict the world in righteousness. He was going to convict the sinners. There are three particular areas I'd like to concentrate on this point, And that is convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. And if we begin looking at that, sin because they did not believe in me. Righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will no longer see me. Judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. So Jesus said that the Spirit would come and he would convict the world in sin. That conviction came through the preaching and the teaching of the apostles and those that they had trained. Secondly, we're going to see the issue of righteousness to convict men of their sin and also also the issue of righteousness concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and his divinity. And again, we're going to note this is based upon the great miracles that Jesus had performed and the resurrection. As we look at the, the point about Jesus, Jesus made some extraordinary claims. 
as we look at his ministry, one of the things we have to concentrate on, and that is this, Jesus made extraordinary claims, but Jesus also did some extraordinary things. His preaching, his teaching, the great miracles that he performed, these signs were there to convict the world. Not only that, we have the greatest, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the wonderful hope that we have because of what Jesus has done for us. Then thirdly, we have this point about rebellious and disobedient people needing to understand something about the judgment to come. There is a judgment that is there before them. So the three main areas of convicting that we have looked at regarding the Holy Spirit is going to be in the issue of sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. I think we have to look at the outstanding example of the convicting power of the Holy Spirit is going to be found in the book of Acts in chapter 2. So here we have Peter and the apostles receiving the Holy Spirit. And as we go through and begin looking at a few texts here, we're going to note that there is this Holy Spirit that comes upon them. They begin to speak in other languages. We've already mentioned that uh, there are these 17 languages that are found there. And one of the things you note about what they do is they begin talking about the fulfillment of prophecy. If you take a look at Acts chapter 2, we're going to begin looking at verse 17. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And we see that the Spirit would be poured upon all flesh. Next, we're going to note that there is something that is said by David regarding the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ as we look at Psalm 16. And then finally... We have Psalm 110 being referred to. In other words, we're going to see the point is made. The Lord said to my Lord, sit in my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So there are these issues here. So he is speaking from the point of prophecy. Jesus fulfilled prophetic, uh, prophetic visions here. Secondly, we're going to see the signs of the miraculous. We're going to note something about what the apostles were doing and how they did it. And finally... They are witnesses. They are witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As you recall, that which we have seen, that which we have touched, that which we have beheld, we beheld with our own eyes concerning the word of God. We're, we're going to say that. We are witnesses of this Jesus Christ. As you recall, they were hiding. They were for afraid when uh, Jesus was crucified. And then all of a sudden, they become bold proclaimers of the word. <clears throat> now, here's where we are. Uh, there's this preaching that goes on. All of a sudden, it said they were convicted. The audience was convicted in their hearts. So how did they get convicted? They were convicted because we have inspired men preaching and speaking. There's the proclamation of Jesus Christ, and they realized that they were in sin, and they responded to the gospel. That is how it happened. Another example is going to be in Acts chapter 16 with Lydia. We're going to note there are a lot of Calvinists that like to use these three verses. Uh, the one that I have in Acts 16, John 6, Acts 11. <clears throat> and particularly we look at what it says about Lydia. It said, and her heart was opened. And, and so they would like to say, well, that's the Holy Spirit working. But if you take a look at what is being said there, we're going to see that it is the word that was spoken by Paul that opened her heart. That's how her heart was opened. That's how it works today as well. <clears throat> and uh, the point is, we're going to note John Calvin has introduced something into the world that is still among us today. There are those that are still very Calvinistic. I've noticed that a lot of the systematic theology books that uh, I've gone through uh, has a lot of Calvinism in it, and, and so you have to deal with that. It's still out there. Uh, the next slide, please. So let's take a look at the idea of the Holy Spirit and the Word. What does the Holy Spirit do in conviction and conversion of a sinner? We're going to note that there is the inspiration of Scripture. That is what is our authority. That is what we're going to use to teach others by. We're also going to note that the Holy Spirit convicts sinners through and only through the medium of the word. We have these apostles. Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to these apostles to teach them, to guide them into all truth. And that's what happened. And so we have these apostles out there proclaiming the word. 
And as we've looked at Acts 2.37, it talked about they were pricked in their hearts. It was because of the preaching of these apostles. And those on Pentecost were preached in their heart because of the words of which Peter had spoken. Now, <clears throat> the word in the book. Let's take a look at that for a moment. During the miraculous age, we're going to see that the word was in the man. These inspired apostles and prophets and uh, uh, evangelists, as we begin to see that they're being directed by the Spirit. But eventually, there's the passing of these inspired men. What we have is the word that was left behind. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God, we know. We're going to see holy men of God spoke as they were moved along by the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that inspired these writers and only the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we're going to see that this infallible book, the New Testament, is the means and the medium of the operation of the Holy Spirit today through His Word and only through His Word. Next slide, please. So there are a number of passages I'd like for us to look at regarding this, and, and let's look at these passages for a moment, and that is, how does the, op the Holy Spirit operate? Through the Word and the Word only as we look at this. So notice this. Jesus on one occasion said, the seed is the Word of God. That seed is planted within the heart of mankind. And it is the Word of God that convicts. Now, again, is that a direct operation of the Holy Spirit, or is that the preached or the taught word that we're talking about here. Secondly, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that hears my word and believes in him, or believes him that sent me, has eternal life. Again, it was the idea of hearing the word of God and not some direct operation of the Holy Spirit. The words that I have spoken unto you are spirit and life. Again, we see the power of the word of God being used at this point. Next, he that rejects me and receives not my saying has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him at the last day. We'll be judged by this word. That is the point. The word of God is living and it is active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and quick to discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So we see the power. We see the quality of the word. Luke says on the day of Pentecost, they that received the word were baptized, not those that received the Holy Spirit were baptized. They were given the ordinary gift of the Spirit as we looked at Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. And then in Acts chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, many of those who heard the word believed. There's Cornelius. And an angel said to Cornelius to go to Joppa, have someone go to Joppa and get Simon. And he will be the one that will speak to you, what? Words whereby you will be saved. Next, we're going to note in James, father of his own uh, will, uh, brought us forth by the word of truth. And again, it's the idea of the word of truth that is going to inspire us to educate us. And then finally... I'd like for us to think about we have been begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, which is the Word of God, which lives and abides, the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. That is the direction that we're going with our lesson. Let's look at the next slide. If we look at this, we're going to see first the doctrine of the direct operation of the Holy Spirit in conviction and conversion is going to violate a number of principles. First of all, we're going to say that it violates the principle of impartiality. God is going to give salvation to all of humanity, but he did not give the gift of the Spirit in the sense of the baptism of the Spirit to everyone, but only a few. He gave this gift to those that were his apostles. So we have two accounts, Acts 2, Acts 10, and that's it. And therefore, if we're going to see God is going to impartially give the Spirit to just a few people here and there every now and then, we're going to see that that is going to show that God is not impartial. The second thing is the direct operation of the Holy Spirit in conviction and conversion is going to affect the free moral agency of man. Uh, we have the choice to either choose or not choose. There are decisions that we make. And it is important that when we do choose, we choose because we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ and not based on our feelings that we have 
at a particular time. Uh, there was a professor that I had at Harding one time, and he said that there's a religious group out there that likes this particular phrase, it is better felt than telt. In other words, I don't care what you tell me, it's how I feel about the situation. So everything that I've shown you so far this morning is going to be contrary to what has been said. Thirdly, we're going to note that it violates the principle of the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized will be saved, but he that does not believe will be condemned. And therefore, we're going to see why do we need to go if there's a direct operation of the Holy Spirit without the Word of God being introduced to them? You wouldn't even know of the Holy Spirit had you not read about the Holy Spirit in your Bible. Someone had read it and taught it to you. So in conclusion, one more slide, please. Let's notice this. There are some things that we can definitely know. One can know of an absolute certainty that apart from the Word of God, a person cannot possibly know that there's the Holy Spirit. One can know with certainty that no conversion has ever been where the gospel, either written or spoken, has not gone. One can know of an absolute certainty that the vehicle or thought from the mind of the spirit or the mind of man is the word of the spirit. And then fourthly, one can know of an absolute certainty that the gospel message is God's power unto salvation. All right. Uh, here we see a couple of thoughts here. Uh, I have four minutes left. So uh, the message for today is that uh, we have the gospel. It's in written form. Therefore, it's important that we study our Bibles. It's also important for us to understand that we are all a part of this wonderful body of Christ. He came to die for all of humanity. He loves us all. We have a great brotherhood, and uh, we need to love one another. Jesus said the idea, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, but he also, if you love one another, everyone will know that you're my disciples. So we have a lot of things to consider there. The strength of the gospel, the, the message, it is there for reproving, rebuking, exhorting, for instructing, for helping us to understand what is God's will. And then we also see the church, it is one body, and the, the unity is under consideration. By the way, there's this one baptism that we looked at in Ephesians chapter 4. That is the baptism for today, not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So look at this for a moment. Uh, notice in 1 Corinthians, we're going to see a number of things that these people had done. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God and therefore do not, and there's a, sin, a list of sins that are mentioned that you don't do? And he says this in verse 11, such as were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Paul, as an apostle, would not set before his readers the horrors of sin without bringing back the subject of redemption. They had been cleansed. They had been sanctified. They had been justified. They have this wonderful privilege of coming before God and worshiping a God. Just imagine what these people were like beforehand and what they are today. We've talked about the before. We've talked about the after. Take a look at these people. Maybe you know people as well, the before and after, the idea of what they were like before and what they are like today. What a wonderful blessing that we have from God that God will make us a different people. There is this initiative that God had taken. It is the responsibility of those that hear this word to accept it and to respond to it and then understand that you have a new set of values that you're going to live by. Don't go back to the old lifestyle. Stay with the lifestyle that God has given to you. And then the final thing is we need to be a people of unity. We are a body of Christ. We are to reflect this unity and this spirit of love throughout the world in which we live. And so therefore may God be with us as we strive toward this end in the name of Lord Jesus Christ.